lesson geared towards them, and there's always a craft down there, a lot of good stuff going on. Sometimes we have a group of younger guys show up, and then we try to have a second uh, second group of them downstairs. If anybody ever wants to help with the second group, let me know that. Um, we have some folks that can do that. Uh, the teens do a great job with the older kids, and uh, we could use some teens and some adults possibly if there are a bunch of younger kids here. Your kids aren't here today, so we don't have that issue, but um, some days we do, so some days we need some help. So. We have a lot to get to today. I have a really long scripture. When you do a, a, a message, when you do a sermon, people say, don't use a lot of scripture. And I say, that's crazy. I'll use as much scripture as we possibly can. Like, um, not that I want to stand here and read the Bible for the next half hour, but our scripture this morning is long. So if you want to turn to Acts 10, we're going to be reading 1 through 48. It's a really good story, but we need to hear that whole entire story from God's word. There's so much in that story that we need to learn. So we're going to be there in just a few minutes. Our message this morning is entitled, God Can Make a Difference Through You, and Here's How. So we're going to learn today how to allow God to make a difference through our lives. We're going to read a written scripture. We're going to have a great story um, to tell us um, how, to, how to do that. So that's where we're going to be going here in just a few minutes. Um, over the past few weeks, last week we had Undefeated here. They let us worship. They'll be back again. They're on the road. They're in Illinois, so headed to Illinois, so they're not going to be leading worship um, with us. They'll be back at the beginning of October uh, for two weeks in a row, and they'll be on the road again. So, uh, anyways, they spoke their hearts. Young men and women, older teens spoke. They shared their hearts on the need that they see in the world and what they tried to do to help it. They started this Christian rock band. They're on the road all the time, and they're here when they can, but... Um, but over the last several weeks now, we have been um, reading biblical examples, like real biblical examples of real people that lived in history. They talk about it in the Bible, about how just normal people like you and I made a huge difference in the world, in their corner of the world and beyond. And also, every single week, we've been taking a look at um, a modern-day, real-life story of a person like you and I who just stepped up and did something amazing. So we've been looking at a biblical story and then a real-life story. We're going to do that. Um, here again today. Today, um, we're going to understand how we can allow God to work through us to do something amazing. So we'll be there in a few minutes. Um, often, all of this begins with, we've been talking a lot about sowing and reaping, right? We've been, um, as Christians, we have to see a need. And when we see a need, we learn to look at what we have to fill that need. Um, and so where do we begin in that? We've been talking about how you have to sow holiness in your life, sow God's word into your life, sow truth, righteousness into your life. And when you do that, when you're sowing in this righteousness and goodness over and over, you're coming to worship and you're reading every day and you're praying every day, um, you will see the benefits of that. Fruits will grow in your life. And you're going to learn to love the Lord and love other people at a level that you never knew existed. We've talked about that for a couple of weeks. It seems simple, but often, folks, you and I, sometimes we feel like we we, we feel like somebody hit us in the back of the head saying, who, who do you think you are? Like, who are you kidding? Yeah, God's nudging you to do this, but you can't do this. Like, seriously, you think you're going to make a difference in the world? We hear that all too often. Um, I'm not okay with that. You shouldn't be okay with that. God wants to work through you. The um, truth is that God can and will make a difference through your life. He'll do it. There's many places in the Bible that teach us that. Today, in this long scripture, we're going to read um, one of these stories about how the Bible teaches us um, how to allow God to make a difference in our life. Um, Acts 10, 1 through 48 has a simple story that demonstrates how a Christian can influence or change the world. We're going to see it. We should strive to influence the world around us and not to allow the world around us to influence us, for us and our families and our corner of the world. we got to do it. We've got to step up. So there's five teachings, or there's five keys um, that I pulled out of this text. There's a lot of teachings in the text, but I pulled out five big ones that will help us to allow, allow us or help us to understand how God can work through your life. So let's pray and we'll really dig into the scripture. Father, Father, I just thank you again for allowing us to gather here as a family. Father, I know we could be anywhere this morning. You brought us here from all different directions. We have a lot of stuff going in our going on in our lives. We're all here from different backgrounds, for different reasons. But Father, I pray that each and every person, no matter who we are, where we've come from, I pray that we're here because we want to hear from you. 
Father, I know you have something for each and every one of us. Father, I pray that we just open our minds and our hearts to what it is you have for us this morning. Father, we love you and praise you, but we want to hear from you. We want to be lifted up. We want to be encouraged. And Father, I know you can do that through your word. So, Father, I pray that each and every one, every one of us, we don't just hear the truths that scream out of the scripture, but we listen to it. And we apply it to our lives. We make the changes. We step out of the boat where need be. Father, finally, allow me to speak accurately, clearly this truth you put on my heart to share with this family this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's set the stage a little bit. If you have your books open to, uh, Bibles open to Acts 10, 1 through 48, or just sit back and listen. It is a long scripture. I know sometimes if you don't have the translation I have, you can get caught up in this word or that word. Don't do that. Just listen to the story. Read it follow along or just sit back and just listen to the story. So I'm going to set the stage. I always like to set the stage. You can't just pull a scripture out of context. you gotta got to set the stage. There's going to be two main characters in this story we're about to read, Cornelius and Peter. Okay, Cornelius, who's he? He was a Roman soldier, real-life guy. Centurion he was. What's a centurion? It means 100, right? Cent, 100. He was a Roman soldier that had 100 soldiers under him. So a lot of people... He's responsible for it. And a lot of other people, their families and friends, the whole community looked up to him as well. So it's more than 100, but he's a Roman centurion. He's an important man in the, in the Roman army. And then Peter. Peter was um, Peter, Apostle Peter. Peter traveled with Jesus for a long time. And at this point in time, um, Peter is staying in the area. He's helping churches. He's doing ministry. The scripture will tell us here in a few minutes that he's staying in a house by the sea. He's just helping this young church outside of Rome. So in a very short period of time, in about 30 years that the Christian church has existed so far, the church has grown from being looked at as this, um, just another sect of Judaism, um, people that want to overthrow Rome. That's what people used to be intimidated by the church, right? And, and they tried to put a stop to this Christian church. Um, it became, um, now in 30 years, the church is already starting to become a really important influence in the Roman society. Okay, at this point, uh, most viewed the church as this spiritual movement. It's viewed now, 30 years later, as this spiritual movement and not quite this physical threat that it used to be. So things are changing a little bit. And that just broadens the field. That just broadens the harvest of people that, that can be reached. So, <clears throat> this is where we're going to read this. Um, Acts 10, 1. Grab a quick drink. <coughs> Let me put my Yankee mug down. <laughs> They're going to the World Series. I know there's enough. <laughs> Acts 10 1. Cornelius calls for Peter. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout. God fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. <clears throat> One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel said, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up to us as memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa. To bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Verse 7. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier. One was a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Meanwhile, Peter's vision, verse 10-9. Uh, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open up and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter kill and eat. Verse 14. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. 
The voice spoke to him a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the man sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped by the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. Verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Verse 22, the men replied, We have come from Cornelius, the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he might hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Peter at Cornelius' house. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went, went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Verse 27. <clears throat> While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large crowd, a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or even visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising an objection. May I ask why you sent me? Verse 30, Cornelius answered, three days ago. I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon, and suddenly a man in shiny clothes stood before me. I said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and, and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now, we are all here with the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent the people of Israel. This is still Peter talking, remember. You know the message God sent the people of Israel announcing the good news of Peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the cross. But God raised him from the dead and on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him and that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely... No one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Blessed be the reading of the word. Let's step back from that. What a story. You might be thinking, okay, 
what does that story have to do with me doing great things for God? What does that story have to do with me helping God do something amazing through my life? Well, like I said, there's a lot of teachings in there, but I pulled out five main keys or five main lessons um, that I believe that we can, we can all put into play today to help allow God make a difference through us. So we can be the hands and feet of, of God. So the first lesson I noted here, just to jump straight off the pages, it began both of the, the little stories about Cornelius and Peter. You gotta walk closely with God. That's where it starts. You can't be distant and expect God to work, work through you and do something amazing through you. You can't have him way over here and just ignore him and expect him to do something in and through your life. You have to walk closely with God. What was the centurion doing? What was Peter doing when both of those segments of the story began? They were praying. Cornelius, just picture this guy. He's an important Roman soldier. He's got all these people underneath him. Three in the afternoon, it says, he's praying to God. He took time out of his busy day to stop and pray. It was that important to him. God was definitely a priority in his life. How about you? Do you ever take time out of the middle of the day to pray? Do you ever take time before you eat or before you lay down or when you get up to pray? What do I do? Do we? That's between you and God. He knows. Sit down and think, like, when is the last time I sat and really opened up to God, really prayed and got close to him? Likewise, the story says that Peter was really busy. I mean, Peter started a young church. Upon this rock, I will build my church, Jesus says. He's busy. He's a busy guy, Peter is. Climbed up on the roof in the middle of the day to pray. Pray to God. To listen and thank. At about noon, it says Peter went up to pray. Not, not at night, not first thing in the morning. That's great times to pray. In the middle of the day, in the middle of all this busyness, he goes up on the roof to find this quiet place to focus and pray and listen. So the story shares this typical day in the life of two different men. And it shows us just a glimpse of their spiritual life. God was important to them, a priority. And it wasn't just words. They didn't just say, oh, God, you're important to me. Actions. The middle of the day, there they are praying. All the stuff going on around, they stopped, took time to pray. So we can conclude that they prayed often. This is just a normal day. This is just another day we're reading about. And note that they weren't just wearing the label Christian. They're not just walking around saying, I'm a Christian. They lived it out through their actions. They stopped what they're doing, and they prayed to God. Cornelius gave much he had to the poor, it says. He sacrificed of himself deeply. He was a good guy, well respected by the Jewish community. He took time out of his busy day to pray to God. Peter, of course, he's a, a, a devoted follower of, of Jesus. We know that Jesus says, I'm going to build my church upon you. That's what Peter means, rock. So he is, yeah, he is busy. One man. Peter could have just chosen to, to go back fishing. He could have chosen to live his life and not go through all he had to go through to help the church out. But he did it. He planted churches. He helped churches. He traveled. He stayed in random people's houses, a tanner's house by the, by the sea. In all this business, he prayed often and fervently, listening to God. This is such a huge story in that, that Peter was, in essence, He's, this whole story, he's opening the door to Jesus, to the Gentiles. This is one of the first times we read that they intentionally went after the Gentiles to share the good news to them. Letting these folks know again that Jesus, this message, this is the door that you all need. This is the door. This is the way to heaven. So to make a difference in the world, you and I, we need to pray. We need to be in touch with God. We need to draw close to him, saying about him. We need to listen. And that leads us to the second key in making a difference in the world. Obey. Listen and obey. We sang in the first service, trust and obey. We have to obey what we hear not, what we hear God nudging us to do. That voice that you heard in your mind, do this, take action, do it. The angel came to Cornelius and he said, your prayers were heard. Okay, your, your acts of love were seen. They, they came up to us. We've seen them. But God has more plans for you. Yeah, but I've prayed and I've given all this stuff and now you want more? Yeah, God has something more for you. 
Send some folks, bring Peter here. Peter has something you need to know about. Peter has something for you and your people. So Cornelius, he could have been a proud man. He could have said, I'm a centurion. Why would I ever send for this former Jew, this young Christian guy named Peter? Why do I want him to come and tell me anything? I don't need him. He could have said that. He could have said, I'm too busy for this nonsense. I have too much stuff going on. I've given enough already. How many times do we use those same excuses? I don't have to do that. I don't have to listen to that. I'll do what I want to do. We live in such a selfish world today where people just do what they want to do because that's what they want to do. It doesn't matter what's truth. It doesn't matter what's, who they're harming. It doesn't matter the consequences that are going to come up. That's what's going on here. He's listening, praying. He's in touch with God. He's spending time with him. He hears a message. He takes action on what he hears. Acts 10, 8. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So he took action. Cornelius took a couple of guys and took one of his soldiers and he said, go get Peter. The Lord wants me to get Peter, just go get him. I don't, I don't know what's going on, just go get Peter. He has something we need to hear. So Cornelius heard the instructions, he took action on what he had, his men, and he sent them to get Peter. He obeyed God. How about Peter? Did Peter obey God? Yeah. Um, think about this though. Folks used to hunt down Peter. Some still were. Okay. They wanted to throw him in jail. Folks wanted him dead. Not all that long ago. Peter went through all this stuff. But here he is on a roof. And he hears people yelling. Just picture yourself there. There's three strangers come down the road. And they're, they're like saying to the house. Maybe the other Simon is there. And they're like, where is this Simon Peter? We want him to come with us. You're on the roof hearing that. You don't know who this is. Okay. Let's read the scripture again. Acts 10, 23. Peter then invited them in. And gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went out with them. And then other brothers from other Peter's friends, other Christians went with him. So Peter trusts God. Peter steps out in faith. Think about that. Quite a few years before, Peter stepped out in faith. He got out of the boat, right? He got out of the boat. He focused his eyes on Jesus. He said, Jesus, is that you? And Jesus said, yeah, it's me. And Peter's like, if that's you, tell me to come. He says, come to me. Walk on the water. Jesus got up. Peter got out of the boat, began to walk on the water. He trusted Jesus until what he feared took his attention. The water, wind, waves. His eyes focused on those things. He began to sink into the water. That's you and I all the time. We, we hear these messages. We hear these nudges. And we're like, yeah, God, you and me. Like we go to a retreat or we go to an event or a kingdom on or a concert or something. We get all fired up. We're like, God, I know exactly what you want me to do. And then we take our eyes off of God. We take our eyes off the plan. We, we allow the wind and the waves to, to take our focus. And that's what happened to Peter in the past. But when you walk in the spirit, what happens to the fruits? The fruits grow, right? He's been walking in the spirit for a long time now. Peter has grown. He's not the same old Peter that cut off the ear, right? He's not the same old Peter that doubted. He's not the same old Peter that sank in the waves. He's grown. He's a new Peter. He's a stronger Christian. Because he's been walking in the word, walking in the spirit, living out his faith. Not wearing the label, living the label. So he steps out of the boat here again into the unknown. He's on the roof and he hears people calling for his name. Do they want me dead? Do they going to take me to prison? There's a soldier there from Rome. They're coming at him. No. He listened to God. Didn't know. Had no idea what's going on. He trusted. He obeyed. He went with them. He went with these strangers. Either man could have said no here. Either man could have said no, and the events that took place in the story would have never happened. Imagine if Peter stayed on the roof, or if imagine Cornelius said, this guy can't help me, I'll do it on my own. Imagine if they had the attitude that so many folks had today. Many people would not have heard the good news. The Holy Spirit would have not have entered many people. A lot of Gentiles and others would have not come to Jesus without being prayerfully devoted to God and without this obedience from two ordinary people, many folks would have remained lost. So already we learned that you have to spend time with God in prayer and worship. You have to sow God into your life in order to reach others and see the benefits and, and reap the harvest. you got to sow in to reap the harvest. Truth is, the, the world is going to try to reach you as well. Okay, the world is coming after your kids. And the world's coming after your grandkids. And the world's coming after you. So we read these truths. They all make sense here. Black and white, they make perfect sense here. We get out in the world and they twist them a little bit. 
now all of a sudden what we read in the Bible is no longer that cut and dry out there. The world tells us, does he really say that? It's, it's nothing new, right? The serpent did it in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say not to eat the fruit from that tree? It's the same old game plan. He gets in your head. Did God really say to go to church? Did God really say to read about? Did God really say to pray all without ceasing? He doesn't really mean that. God doesn't really mean you to be obedient to what you read. You can do whatever you want. You can read the rules and then go live any way you want. That's what the world's telling us. That is what the world's telling your kids. It's not okay. Another friend, another person we know, believed the lie is dead. We have to know Romans. Paul, Paul tells the Romans in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this age, but transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good and pleasing. So you may discern what the perfect will of God is. Renew your mind daily, Paul says. And that's what we're reading in the story. These two men, just normal guys like you and I, are praying every day to renew your mind daily. If you give, if you give the world, if you give the devil just a, a foothold, a crack in the door, he's going to open it. Or he's going to entice you to open it. This is probably what will happen. He'll entice you to open it and step out in the wrong direction. I see folks all the time, they come in, they chase hard after Jesus, they get baptized. Oh, it's you and me, Lord. And then they're gone. The world enticed them. The world told them a lie. Do whatever you want. Wherever you feel good. Your will. And they're out just living some fancy life. On their own. Far away from God. We have to, re we have to renew our minds and thoughts daily. Pray. Read. Listen. Come to church often. Listen to the truth. Apply the truth to your life. Walk in the truth. Walk in the word. Why? So that we can better reflect Jesus to the world. It's not all about you and me. It's about our kids. It's about our corner of the world. It's about reaching the lost. we got to step it up. we got to move forward. The world's dying out there. They need Jesus. And that leads us to the third key. The third key, if you want to allow God to do something amazing through you, you've got to be willing to step out of your comfort zone. So we, we read, we draw close to God, we listen, we take action on what we're hearing, and then we step out of our comfort zone. I can't talk to these people. Like, these people are okay. A lot of times we're not even talking to our kids, and that's where it starts. you got to talk to your kids and your grandkids. Okay? Don't just dwell on that. They'll talk to them, plant some seeds, and step out. Who's the next circle? Classmates, co-workers, friends, family, talk to them. Now step out a little further. That's what's going on here. People are stepping out of their comfort zones. Acts 10, 5 through 6, we already read it. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon a Tanner, whose house is by the sea. So again, from the scripture, what do we take out of that? Um, how comfortable would this Roman centurion be with sending people to the Jews for help? Not very comfortable. What's God asking you to do? Where is he nudging you to go and help these different people and we don't feel qualified I can't talk to that type of people whatever it is if God's got that in your heart do it here in the story there's such a stigma a powerful elite man going to ask this former Jew fisherman for advice kind of unheard of he's asking for help from Peter Acts 10 20 already read this God talking to Peter says get up and go downstairs this is the other side of the story Get up and go downstairs and accompany these men. Have no doubts because I've sent them. So again, Peter, what's his natural fear here? He's going to go downstairs and get arrested. His natural fear, like he grew up as a Jew, so he knows all the Jewish law. Now he's a Christian. He knows he can't associate with these Roman people. He's going to go help them. So he must have been at least a little bit unsure. He was told not to doubt. But I'm sure he must have doubted a little bit, okay, just from his background and because of what he's about to say. He doesn't have a clue what's going to happen to him, but he goes anyway. In fact, he invites the strangers in, so he's trusting, he's being obedient, he's taking action. And then in Acts 10.25, they travel to Cornelius' house. He's got a bunch of Christians going with him. There's a bunch of Cornelius' friends and family there, so there's a big mob of people. Two backgrounds, two different past beliefs. <coughs> <clears throat> Acts 10 25. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshiped him. <clears throat> Pardon me. So here the centurion, 
This powerful man falls at the feet of Peter. And Peter says, I'm just a man. <clears throat> and he, he must have been thinking, like, is this some kind of a trick? Like, not only am I here trying to share some good news with this centurion, but he's at my feet, like, groveling, worshiping at my feet. I'm supposed to help this guy? And Peter knows, like, from his history of being a Jew, he knows some background. We know that he's worried about this a little bit. Okay, so the people that went with him had a Jewish background also. And they know that they really shouldn't be there by Jewish law. And they're still young Christians, so they really don't get it yet. So Peter says this. Peter said to them, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with a religious foreigner. So in other words, to his friends, before you guys tell me that we shouldn't be here, before you guys doubt this plan or anything, I'm telling you right now we shouldn't be here. God told me to come. And that's why we're here. Scripture says, but God has shown me that I must not call any person common or unclean. We can't judge people for whatever they're doing. No matter who they are, what they are, what they're into, we are called to share truth with them and help. Just give them Jesus. Don't try to fix them. It doesn't say go there and fix these people. Just go there and share the truth with them. They need something, and you have it. Just go there. So Peter was not only in fear of the unknown uh, when he went to these Romans, but Jewish law, his background, his lifelong beliefs were reminding him, you shouldn't be here. However, I believe that Peter was reaping the harvest of these fruits, right? You walk in the Spirit. It's more than just knowing what the fruits are. Do you see the fruits in your life? Perseverance? Do you have more perseverance? Peter does. He's not going to give up. He's got more love for these strangers, right? He's got more patience. He's got more forgiveness. So I believe that Peter understood and remembered the Great Commission. Go into all corners of the earth, not the corners that I'm comfortable with. Go there. Tell people about Jesus. Start in your own corner. Start with your family. Start with your friends, classmates, co-workers. If we don't stay there, we go. We go somewhere else. Tell people about Jesus where you're uncomfortable. That's what Peter's doing here. That's what he's showing us. Fourth key or lesson is that uh, God looks, that you have to look where God has you. Okay, there's two parts to that. Back at how God got you where you are, and now look at where you are. Okay, we all went through some trials and tribulations to get here. We've all been cleaned and uh, sanctified from a lot of stuff, and we still have a lot long process to go. Okay, we, we sanctification is that cleaning process, the Holy Spirit working inside us, cleaning us from the inside out. We got a long way to go, but look at the journey you've been on. Look at who is in your life right now that you're helping that you didn't used to help before. Okay, God's opening those doors. Who is God telling you to go help when you've been resisting? Okay, so you have to look at where you are. God is working around you. Okay, God is softening hearts. This is so cool. You may have planted seeds in a different city. You live somewhere else. You planted some seeds in your children, your grandchildren, and the seeds um, maybe haven't really grown, but God is working there. Like, be faithful. Get it. That God will soften their hearts. God is tilling the ground. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, it's time to plow up the fields. God is plowing fields. He's tilling the ground. He's softening hearts. Plant a seed again. The soil is not ready to receive the seed. The seed is not ready to receive some water. Go there again. There is your opportunity. God can use you to plant seeds in fresh soil. God can use you to pour out love onto these seeds to help them to flourish. Just the right time, just the right place. It happens all the time. Look for those that God is reaching or softening. Acts 10, 19, we read again, while Peter was thinking about this vision, the Spirit told him, three men are looking for you. These men were looking for Peter because Cornelius wanted to know what Peter had to say. Cornelius' heart had been softened. He was already a good man doing good things, but now his, his now he's ready to hear the rest of the story. Now he's ready to hear the good news from Peter. We see that, yeah, Cornelius is a good man. Yeah, he's doing good things, but he's seeking. He's seeking Jesus. So often all of us, we look for something, there's something missing in our life. We see people out there that go from one relationship to the next. They go from drugs to to alcohol. alcohol, they work like 90 hours a week. They jump all in to whatever it is that they're doing, but they're what they're really searching for is Jesus. We all have that Jesus-shaped hole inside of our heart that only Jesus can fill. 
And until you fill it with Jesus, you don't get that, you don't understand it. But that's what's happening. Your heart's being softened. Those that desire it. So God softened these people's hearts. Not just Cornelius, but his whole family. He's been working on them. He's been softening their hearts. The centurion knew there was more, and Peter was coming to give it to him. And God sends people our way all the time. And God leads us to people all the time that need to know about Jesus. They need the gospel, the good news of Jesus. God can give us these divine appointments. Let's say, like I talked to the kids this morning, if somebody walks in here this morning and you went through the same thing that person's going through, that person might need to talk to you this morning. You decide to go apathetic instead of coming to church, that person now is missing their opportunity to gain help. It's so important that we're in the lives of the church family. That God can also give us these divine appointments. Um, God can use you and I as these personal jars of clay to carry that good news out into the world, to the world that needs it. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, one last, um, before we get to that, real quick example on that one. Okay, God softening hearts of people, that doesn't make sense. Cornelius, think about Cornelius. Head of 100 people, right? 100 soldiers plus other people. Good man, the Bible said. Well respected by the Jewish community. Didn't know Jesus. Okay, he had contacts, he had stuff, he had means, he had physical abilities, he had financial abilities to help people, and he was. He was a really good man. Here comes Peter alongside him. I can't help but think about some of the ministries that we have going on here in church. There are some really good people out there that are reaching thousands and thousands of people that we can't reach because we're here, and they're already there. They're already helping all these people, but they don't have Jesus. They're helping them because they're good upstanding people. And they know they're missing something and they're seeking it. God will open a door. He'll open an opportunity for us to come in alongside of these people who are already reaching thousands of people and now we can add Jesus to it. So instead of just handing someone a sandwich or whatever it is, we can now hand them a sandwich with Jesus, a side of Jesus, or Jesus with a side of sandwich, whatever it is. But we can do that now. So we have to be open to what's going on in our community. Sometimes that requires things to change. So we are going to see some changes here in some of our events and some of our activities. God has already opened the doors. He's already softening hearts of people that can potentially touch thousands of people that you and I can. But we can help through him. We can all be Peters in this situation. I'll share more about this as we go. Some of you might catch on to what's going on. Maybe, maybe you don't, but we will eventually. I can't see a lot right now, but we have these opportunities coming up, several of them, and different, vastly different opportunities where we can reach um, people in different ways. God's just making it all possible. It's nothing to do with us. It's all to do with us praying, being faithful, using what we have, seeing a need, and using it. So the last one, I'll hit this one really quick. The last key or lesson in the story that I pulled out um, that will allow you to have God make a difference through your life, great, great impact to the world around you, um, the last thing that we pull out of the story is you can't worry about the opinions of other people, Okay. Don't worry about the other people. You have to disregard the um, unconstructive criticism, the non-constructive criticism. Constructive criticism, yeah, you can listen to people, listen to comments, listen to suggestions. You can listen to all that. But you have to ignore the doubters. You have to ignore the, the gossips and the negativity. You have to uh, rise above the noise. you got to rise above the uneducated murmur. Like They don't know what's going on. You might have things in place that they have no idea what's going on. They're just not being patient. You have to rise above that stuff. That's what was going on in the story. Okay. You, might, you might doubt yourself as Peter did in Acts 10.13. Um, then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything common or ritually unclean. So you might be uncomfortable with what God is asking you to do. Okay, it might be a big change in your life. Um, so first, the negativity is coming from your own mind. That's what Peter's experiencing here. He's hearing the doubts, the uneducated murmur in his own mind. He doesn't know the whole picture yet. He doesn't know what's going on. Okay, so you have to understand that. Um, listen to God. Trust. Obey. Erase your own um, doubts. Erase your own thoughts. How? Through prayer and through action. When God says, do this, you step out and do it. Your faith grows because you're like, wow, it's not the outcome of your obedience. You just see, like, yeah, that made a difference to one person. I helped one person. I helped a thousand people. I'm going to do it again. God will listen to you again. 
But then others might hear your plan. God tells you to do something, you share it with somebody else, and they're like, that's the dumbest thing. You don't have money for that. We can't do that. Do you know? Do you know what you have to do to carry that plan out? Do you know that the, the work that's going to take? Do you know the people you need to carry this plan out? And people will doubt you. They'll, they'll throw things in your way, roadblocks. Um, they'll tell you it's a bad idea. They'll tell you it won't work. What you got to do is pray. Stand in the truth that you hear. Stand in those nudges. Um, ask yourself, is this plan holy? Is this plan within God's will? Will this plan point people to Jesus or point them away? If it's all those things, yes, do it. Be all in. Yes, I will do that. I will make a difference. So Peter goes to the Romans house. He talks to them. He preaches to them. And folks receive Jesus. They receive the Holy Spirit and they get baptized. Often people are going to be resistant to what God wants you to do. It's going to happen. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe your kids. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your friends. Maybe it's your church. Maybe it's a different church. Here the Jewish culture was resistant. Peter himself was resistant based on his background. The church was resistant, critical, skeptical. But Cornelius and his crowd, remember all his friends and family, Peter and his crowd that all went with him to, to see Cornelius. So that many Romans, many Jews, many Gentiles overcame all that resistance, all the baggage that they brought with them, all the doubts, all the fears. They got rid of it all because they wanted to be part of what God wanted to do there. And God was moving, and God was spreading his message by softening the hearts of all the people that were there, by preparing hearts, by prompting Christians to be his hands and feet. You might just be resistant to what God wants you to do. Uh, maybe God is working in your heart, softening your heart. you got to pray. you got to be into it. Um, just as God worked in the hearts of Cornelius and Peter, just think about Peter. God never gave up on Peter. He just continued to, to chase him down. Now he did that with Cornelius as well. So yeah, God can do amazing things through you, through your life. Yes, you can make a difference in your world. God can make a difference through you in your world. In this story, we see that Cornelius and Peter, they prayed, they were obedient, they stepped out of their comfort zones, they went where God led them. And they found themselves not worrying about what other people thought or what they thought themselves. Let's end it with a question. How about you? Do you, do you believe that God can make a difference in the world through your life? Do you really believe that? That God can use you? Do you believe it? I ask the kids, that's why we're here. Worship the Lord. Learn more about the Lord. Share Him with others. No, he'll make him known. We can talk about this all year. The kids hit the nail on the head. That's what we're doing here. This is what we need to do. This story is a perfect example of just saying yes to God and obeying what he asks us to do and working with other people. I don't have all the details. You don't have all the details. We feel nudges from God. We can do something together. God opens doors and says, here, do this. And when we show God that we can use what we've already what we already have here, like every room in this building, you say it's just a church building, one of twenty-four in the Carthage area. Yeah, one of twenty-four churches. Imagine if all twenty-four churches were filled with people so we could stand up and do amazing things for the Lord. You know, this whole region would, would change. Well, it starts with you, it starts with me, it starts now, it starts here. Look around for the need. What do you have you can fill it with? So back to the question. How about you? Do you believe that God can make a difference in the world through you? And if you say yes, sit back and think about what is he doing? How is God working through me? Even if you reach one person, God's doing amazing things for you because that one person might end up being a, going to Liberty University and becoming a pastor in a huge church and reach thousands of people. You don't know. You might volunteer to do Sunday school one morning and the next Billy Graham is sitting there. And hears you talk about Jesus, and he gets on fire and wants to know. We don't know what's going on. So, do you believe that God can do something amazing through you? And if you say, yes, he is doing something through me, know what that is exactly, because that becomes part of your testimony. Now you can share that with the people in your corner of the world. And say, look, I don't understand it all. I'm just a person. But I prayed to God, and I listened to him, and I drew close to him. 
and I listened to him more, and I prayed more, and I stepped out in faith. I got out of the boat. I walked on the water. I kept my eyes focused on Jesus, and amazing things keep happening. And I don't understand why. I'm just a normal person saying, yes, that's part of your story. People need to hear that. People need to know it because that will inspire others to get out of the boat as well. Last question, what could you be doing? If you don't think that God can work through you, you can dig into the Word. Go read this whole story again. Come talk to me. I'll share you some stories about God working in different people's lives. And so each and every week we've been taking not just a biblical look, but we've been looking at a real-life look. So that's what this uh, kind of supposed to be a train station delivery dock thing. Different than last year's picture, if you see. I don't know where that backdrop went. It's probably up there. But uh, there was a husband and wife, Mike and Jill. They came up with the idea back in 1990 of helping children. And I, I shared a lot of it this morning. I'm not going to go through a lot of that again. But in 1990, there was a war going on in Romania. And there was a lot of parents killed and a lot of children were not, and there was a lot of children that had nothing. So Mike and Jill came up with this idea to start um, Operation Christmas Child. They didn't call it that. They just filled shoe boxes. 1993, they get Franklin Graham involved. 1995, Franklin Graham gets Samaritan's Purse involved. Move ahead to now, 10.5 million children will receive these boxes of gifts and will receive the good news of Jesus Christ, all because one husband and wife saw the need and they filled it. They go to the church and say, church, you need to help these people. I guarantee the church is already helping those people in different ways. I guarantee it. Who's the church anyways? We are the church. So every time we say the church should be doing this or that. No, you should be doing this or that. I should be doing this or that. That's the church. Okay, the church is not some big fictitious animal somewhere doing good things. Okay, it is people putting their hands and feet on the ground. And we got really another good opportunity coming up here. I'll be sharing more about it soon. Nothing to do with music. Something completely different. But uh, we have another opportunity. This is our opportunity right now, though, to fill these boxes, bring them back. It's an opportunity for us. Okay, the good thing about these boxes is every child that receives this box is going to hear the gospel message at least three times. Okay, so these boxes on the 10th, November 10th, bring them back. 17th, absolute bottom line, you got to have them back to 17th because I'm taking them on the 18th or the 17th. I'm taking them to the next place where they get put in a huge room full of boxes. Um, we have to go through them first, go online. There's papers up front here. There's papers on the back table. Sign out a box if you're taking a box or two or whatever. Um, go shopping with your kids. Do it with your kids. Let them know why we're doing this. There's all kinds of materials. A website on the bottom teaches you how to fill a box, why we're filling the boxes, what to put in there. Some fun stuff, some needed stuff, all that kind of good stuff. And uh, what goes in there also is a copy of the gospel in that child's own language. Okay, so these boxes go to a, a bigger place. They'll go to North Carolina, and then they'll get shipped to over 150 different countries, including the United States. So there's kids in the United States going to receive these. But 150 countries around the world are going to receive these boxes. 10.5 million people, kids, last year received the box. And they don't just dole out the boxes, okay? They have these big worship events. There's thousands of people, you like you and I, just normal people, thousands of people are trained on how to hand out a box. So you know, that doesn't take a lot of training to hand a box. No, they have a worship service. They bring all these people in, no matter what country this is in. And they sit the people down. And they sit the kids down. And then they share the whole gospel message with them. The same one that Peter shared with the Gentiles in this story. All about Jesus. They get it. They hear it. God loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. There's more to life than just playing games. That's all good, but there's more to life than that. And then they get the box. And then the kids are crazy. They get to open the box and look at all the things in there. Inside, there's a gospel message. They can read it over and over. That's the second actual time to get it. And then those kids are invited to come back. That same group of adults, they run a program for the next 12 weeks in all these countries. And all those kids are invited to come back. They say a very high percentage of them come back. About half of the kids that receive a box will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's how it works out. So those kids come back to this 12-week program, and they'll hear about Jesus for 12 weeks in a row. Um, I've talked to a lot of people who received these boxes in the past. Um, I've been in different countries where they do this program. They receive boxes to hand out. I saw the other end. I saw the next step where they have these worship services to hand out boxes in Latvia. In Lithuania, they, they take the boxes that we send them and other countries send them and they hand them out. So it's amazing. 
we'll talk more about it. But that's our, our chance. Um, just look for the need, fill the need. Here's one thing that we can do. Um, don't ever believe that you can't be used by God because you can. Don't believe the fears, the doubts, and the lies. Um, God loves you and he wants to work through you. And you just got to pray. You got to take steps on what you hear. Take action on it. And you just got to believe. You got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to understand and believe that God is softening hearts around us to, to do more ministry, to plant seeds again or water other seeds. Um, God will make them grow in time. We can't worry about that. What we got to worry about is people that don't know Jesus. So I got a really quick message, just a really quick video. I think it's a minute and 50 seconds, all about Operation Christmas Child. And then uh, we'll be done. I got a couple of announcements that are kind of important. Watch the video, the video first. 